Good afternoon, everybody. It's five o'clock in New York City, and uh, we're in the middle of a thunderstorm here. I don't know where you're watching from or where you are in the world, but thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the third in an ongoing series of talks, uh, white columns that are being held on the occasion of our 50th anniversary exhibition, uh, which is on view at the gallery through July 31st. Um, and it's a great pleasure today to be in conversation with Margaret Lee, who you can see on the screen as well. And um, I'll just give a brief introduction to Margaret and then uh, we'll begin. Uh, Margaret is an artist and a curator, and she was the founder of an artist run space in New York City called 179 Canal, uh, which as its name suggests, was located at 179 Canal Street, one of New York's uh, busiest thoroughfares. Uh, the image you can see on screen is a, a photo of the space, and we can discuss that in a minute. Uh, 179 Canal was active only from March of 2009 through to June of 2010, so less than a year uh, and more than a decade ago. Uh, but in 2010, shortly after 179 ceased activity, uh, I invited Margaret to think about making an exhibition at White Columns that took 179 canals at its departure point. And that exhibition took place in November of 2010, so about six months later. Uh, before that, I'd met Margaret as an artist and in fact invited her to have a solo exhibition at White Columns, which I can't remember if that was actually your first solo, it would have been your first solo exhibition, Margaret, but the exhibition actually turned into a three artists collaboration uh, between Margaret, Michelle Abels and Darren Bader and that took place earlier in 2010. Uh, as a result of these kind of conversations, myself and Margaret then subsequently uh, organized a series of collaborative projects uh, that took exhibitions with our own work uh, that took place in uh, New York and Milwaukee, which I think were both in 2012, and then in Los Angeles in 2013, which also included the work of Marlon Mullen, uh, who's now represented by uh, JTT and Adams and Ullman galleries. Uh, Margaret's most recent solo exhibition, which I hope some of you had a chance to see, took place in New York, Jack Henley, uh, in 2020. 2020? Uh, during the pandemic, and we'll discuss that later. So Margaret, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see you. I think you're in your studio uh, uh, in New York's Canal Street. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> uh, we shall begin. Uh, so I, I wrote some questions, which is just really a structure for our conversation. They may not, uh, we may not adhere to that. But um, as I mentioned, we met in 2009 at 179 Canal. And, um, you know, before we talk in any detail about 179 Canal and what it was, uh, could you just perhaps briefly say something about what you were doing prior to 179 Canal? And... Uh, what your observations or thoughts were about the art world or the art community around that time. So we're talking around 2009. Uh, well, when I graduated from college in 2001, I was hired as an assistant for various artists straight out of college. So I sort of had my first foray very early. Um, you know, eventually I got my job working for Cindy Sherman in 2003. So I sort of had a glimpse into the art world. Of course, this is the very upper echelon of it. Um, so as a 23 year old, um, while I was exposed to parts of the art industry, because I didn't go to grad school and I also didn't go to art school, I was maybe a little floundering, a little bit lost to find my artistic tribe. Um, it kind of seemed like in order to get that, you had to go to grad school. But because I, had, I was gainfully employed, I didn't really want to go into debt. So um, I spent some years just observing. Um, I wouldn't say I was active. Um, were you working as an artist whilst you were observing? Trying, you know, it's the typical, didn't have enough money to have a studio. Um, was making sculpture, so wasn't quite sure how to make sculpture. And then in a, if, even if I had a studio, where would I store it? I wasn't getting any sort of exhibition invitations. So what was the point of making art? You know, I was always active, 
in terms of drawing, sketching, reading, watching movies. Um, Cause I didn't go to art school. I felt like I had to sort of catch up on a lot of that. Um, spend time watching so many movies, <laughs> um, going to see live music. I, I had a very academic college uh, experience in, as a history major. So um, I think I had to learn a bit of that sort of be a sponge for many years. Um, I mean, was, it, was that a, an, an unusual path to becoming an assistant to an artist and especially a prominent artist given your college experience at undergraduate? I mean, it's how, how do you come out of a history degree working with an artist? When I was in college, I took a few art classes because I needed to relax. I thought I was gonna take a sculpture class and do ceramic life like nude modeling where like a nude model would come in and we do ceramic work or like clay work very classical and instead it was Keith Edmire and Banks Violette who were my instructors and it was my first exposure to contemporary art and I sort of fell in love at that point so when I graduated from college Keith hired me um, straight out of school so I was very lucky in that way where I mean, I've never applied for a job, as insane as that sounds, besides applying for like jobs in college um, as, as an adult, I, I've never applied for a job. Um, so I just, once I got that in, I sort of got passed around until I landed my job at Cindy, but it was a very sort of small world, kismet, serendipity. I knew someone's sister and this person knew that person, and, um, which shows how small the art world can be in some ways, um, even though it seems so big. So when, when I met you in 2009, you had a studio at the address 179 Canal. Mm -hmm. And can, can you say how the, you, you came to be in that building and then how you came to take on the space that became 179 Canal, the exhibition space? And we see an image of that on the screen. I'm assuming this is the, the condition you found it in or during renovations. So I found my studio on Craigslist. I just really wanted to be in the thick of it. Uh, I love Chinatown. And like you said, it's one of the busiest thoroughfares in New York City. I just loved the idea of being able to go and eat delicious food for lunch and buy groceries. So I just found this studio on Craigslist. And then I was there for about a year and this fire just like ripped through the building. The, the picture we're looking at is the second floor of 179 Canal. I was on the fourth floor and so it was a walk up and I was always walk by this locked door on the second floor. And once the fire happened, the fire department had to basically break every door down to make sure that, you know, the fire was put out throughout the building. So after the fire, when I went to go see, you know, oh, is my stuff ruined, what's gonna happen? poked my head into this second floor and it was like a dream come true. It had chandeliers, this marble floor. It had been vacant for a very long time and that this picture kind of shows the condition in which I found it. But once, once you had seen the space, did you immediately have the thought, oh, I should do something? Or is that an idea that had been percolating for a while? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't think that I was going to be staging art exhibitions. I saw it and I immediately was like, this is amazing for parties. Um, the first events I threw were actually parties. I wasn't that interested in um, making art shows in that capacity. I think just the way I grew up, um, you know, I just, some of my most formative memories are like going to my first like rave at 14 on Hudson Street in some warehouse that looks like this in some way, but much larger. And so it's always been in my mind, like a rite of passage in New York is to like find a space with potential and throw a party. Whether you throw three or two or 10 or one, it's just felt like something that one should do when given an opportunity like this. Also because it was so derelict and rough, it didn't seem 
like anyone would want to put art in this space, you know? Like who would want to put their work in a space with these green walls and like the chandeliers and no proper lighting? So what was the point when, you know, the, the transition occurred from seeing a space, thinking about a space, throwing parties in a space, and then starting to imagine that this could be something else. I mean, prior to 179 opening in March of 2009, did you already have, you know, an existing network of artist friends who, you know, you hung out with, you followed their work, you visited each other's studios. Was that narrative already in, in the making? Uh, yeah, I had sort of met um, Josh Klein in 2008 and, you know, the recession was probably the most significant, the 2008 recession is probably the most significant sort of news event that affected my life, you know, at that time. And Josh and I had become friends and Josh, I'd never really known anyone like Josh before. He was so clear in, his artistic vision and what he thought art should be, how it should be seen, what, what we should do, you know. And so when I realized that throwing parties was too difficult, which it was, because it's illegal, um, and as fun as they are, I really didn't want to get arrested. And I, it, dealing with this like illegal cash bar and, and hiding from the cops, and it was just too stressful. So I knew that I had already formed this relationship with my landlord and I kind of promised him I would clean up the space. I would try to rent out these like empty because the whole building was emptied out after the fire. I try to rent out these studios for him, bring artists in, rent out studios so that he could recover. So he said, okay. I said, so can I use the space for a month? I want to put on these art shows and maybe it'll draw some people in, nice renters who will rent studios in the building. So the first person I approached was Josh. And I was like, Josh, it just seems like I can't throw parties forever. And I guess the next rite of passage is do your own <laughs> do-it-yourself show. And, you know, obviously we're not the first people to have that idea in New York City. And at the time, because of the recession, there are a lot of people who are active, you know, apartment show and pop-up spaces here. And it just became, it seemed okay to put on exhibitions in non-traditional spaces. Whereas before I didn't really feel that that was cool or what people wanted. I think that there was like a new generation of young galleries that opened when I was in my mid twenties. And so your goal was kind of to show at one of those galleries. Right. But when the recession happened, galleries started closing and it really seemed that established galleries really weren't going to put they weren't gonna take on any risky artists or like, um, so, you know, young people did as they do. And we all started just putting on shows wherever we could. So the energy was also already in New York um, because of the recession. And because of the recession, there was available space. I mean, the thing that shocks me the most is I got to do this project for a year paying very, very, very minimal rent. And I just don't see that opportunity um, exist anymore. So when this is the image we see on the screen now is of the cleaned up space, uh, which still, you know, I think retains a lot of its kind of uh, original characteristics. So the, the, the renovation as such was fairly light. <laughs> But when 179 Canal started to do things in a public way, beginning, you know, March of that year, um, 2009, did it feel to you very much like, or to other people, was it understood that this was Margaret's project and that it was, it was a space run by you, or, or was it a more collective or collaborative enterprise from the outset? I don't know that anyone would have known who I was. So, um, it seemed to be just more like there's a thing going on on the second floor at 179 Canal. I think a lot of the artists that 
you sort of infused the space with this energy also didn't have name recognition. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, so-and-so is doing this really cool pop-up. You could say names, but I don't know that it would spark a recognition in most people. Um, so was the, was the original audience for the work your friends, other artists, friends of those artists, and it grew. Right. So Josh, again, was very um, important in, he organized the first show. We're looking at this installation. And, you know, with Josh, I was like, it's your show. I, I just want to help facilitate it, but I have no input, right, in this. And so he started inviting all these people. It's where I met Antoine Catala for the first time, Trevor Shimizu, some of the other artists like Amy Yao and Annika Yi that already, I've already was friends with. Um, and I think there were eight people in that show. So the opening was, you know, the friends of these eight people and it sort of just grew from there. And, and were, were you conscious at the time or is it true that the program or the, the, the community around 179 was quite generational in the sense that most of the artists were quite close in age. I know that's not exclusively the case, but there was a kind of generational mm -hmm. because I, I, when we did the show at White Columns, which we'll come to in the end of 2010, uh, there's a quote from you in the press release, which is where you, um, you, you talk about 179 as a project amongst a group of artists and you say, and I'll quote, that you, you were tired of art about art, business as usual, and the heavy history of a past that wasn't necessarily ours to reference. So I'm just curious about that sort of generational aspect of 179. And you've already alluded to the idea that obviously artists in the past in New York had done similar projects in different circumstances. And in fact, White Columns began as a similar idea at 112 Green Street in 1970. But this idea of your generation of artists you know, engagement with the, the past, recent or otherwise, but also a desire to create a kind of present tense and consequently a future for yourselves? I think one, okay, so Josh and I are basically the same age. We would have gone to high school together. We would have graduated in the same year. We're also this sort of bridge generation between people who didn't grow up with the internet and then people who became very fluent in the internet culture was changing very, 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 very quickly. Um, and we were a generation of artists who could hold, you know, both the past because we knew what it was like to have like rotary phones and pay phones and not having cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. But seeing so clearly what culture was going to bring us, you know, the internet, I guess back then seemed kind of quaint, but at the time it's, um, I mean, social media didn't exist in the same way, but the fact that we had this tool that just opened the world up to us, like, you wanna know about something, just type it into the search engine. You wanna listen to something, type it into the search engine. You wanna look at something, type it into the search engine. It was a sense of like possibility that um, felt very freeing in a lot of ways. Like we don't have to be limited to this sort of very, strict linear narrative of what our history is. It starts in Western Europe, and this is the trajectory, and this is this school, and this is that school. You really started to feel at the moment that the internet was creating a lot of confusion as well, and we were able to sort of insert ourselves into that. And I mean, I think also coupled with the recession, you, there are just certain times where there are these openings where you can, you just find an, a point where you can you can break the timeline for a second. Whether or not you get drawn back into it is another thing. But in that time, it felt that we could be divergent in a way. Um, and that that divergence wouldn't just fizzle out in a second, that we could actually maybe walk this path for a little bit longer to see where um, it went or where culture would meet us. Because you know, one of the things that interested me and obviously I was at least a generation older than nearly everybody involved with 179 Canal, maybe two generations older than the majority of people involved with it, is that that, you know, regardless of social media or technology or the internet, the what seemed to have occurred quite quickly at 179 Canal and what seemed to be a large part of its momentum 
was an in-person community of people that gathered around whatever ideas were on display at any given time. And that grew incrementally, not in a particularly huge way, but it seemed to me that the interest in what was happening at 179 Canal developed relatively quickly, given it's somewhat organic, scrappy, and you know, unprofessional in the best sense of that word, way of going about things. One of the reasons I think 179 was able to actually get through a year was um, I was fortunate enough to meet artists who, again, like Josh, were very clear in what they wanted to make their work about. And so as like the facilitator of the space, I never had to hold anyone's hand. I never had to like coax anything out of anyone. And who were we making this art for? You know, we were making it for each other. We were, it almost felt like, you know, a battle in some way. Like, what are you gonna bring to the table? And like, no one's gonna hold your hand. No one's gonna like make sure you have to come. Like people would come, their press releases were written. The install plan was done. You know, the ideas were there, whether or not, you know, it looked professional or not. There was never any hesitation on the part of most of the artists. Also, there was no time. Like, you know, I'd usually be like, do you want to show uh, next week? <laughs> two weeks? How much, you know, two, maybe two months was the longest someone got. And because we're lucky enough to have this sort of group form, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's a chicken and the egg situation. Like, people start talking about certain things, it brings in those who are interested in it because they feel that that conversation isn't happening enough. So we would talk about certain things and it would bring people with those interests in and then we'd have more audience and then there'd be like this feedback, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And there was a lot of like, not handholding, but like idea checking in. You know, like, oh, I want to talk about this. Oh, that's so interesting. I'm working on this. You know, it, it wasn't collaborative per se, but again, like, it's so rare to feel that you have such a engaged audience for your ideas. You know, like when I thought about what it might be like to show in a commercial gallery, I was so very intimidated. Like, oh, I'm gonna have to work with this art dealer who's like maybe my parents' age. And I'm gonna have to prove something to them that my idea is relevant or maybe can make them money or I, I have to prove a novelty in some way. And it always made me feel very uncomfortable. I never, I, I don't like to seek the approval of older people, no offense. <laughs> um, and so to do it amongst your peers, you know, it was just a lot of fun, you know? It was a lot of, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying, oh my, oh my God. And it just encouraged you to sort of, you know, push an idea even further because no one was like, that's absurd. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. That's not valid. What's your reference? It's, it's as if, like when I was a history major, I always had to have primary source documents, right? That's the discipline. You have to go through the archive. You need proof, you need evidence. And I sort of love this thing where it wasn't evidence-based. Right. Yeah. Sort of and, you know, the, the space begins, as we see in this image in March 2009. I mean, how quickly after that did you realize or occur to you that you're actually running a space with a program that had an identity, that had an audience that was growing? I mean, were you aware of those things or were those things paramount or was the activity of doing things more urgent? I, I planned it so the activity was more urgent. I didn't have a moment to spare. This first show it was May 1st. And I asked the landlord for one month of free rent. And so I said, I'll do four shows. Each show will be a weekend long. So there are four shows in this month of May. I think there were also performances within it. I can't really remember, but you know, it was like every week, install, deinstall, install, deinstall. And I suppose I became sort of addicted to that activity. I loved being the last one in the space, cleaning up the cans, mopping by myself or whoever stuck around to help me. And you know, I've worked in bars before and sort of nightclubs. And it just reminded me of that, those times like, oh, it's back of house life, the party's over, the party officially starts. <laughs> 
all the staff sticks around to clean up and chit chat. And there's sort of an intimacy for those who like stick around to help you clean up. And I think I like love those moments. Like I love the setup. I loved making, I had this punch bowl. I always make punch installation. The conversations that I would have during installation were, you know, where I learned the most because you have to ask, why, well, why do you want to install it this way? Oh, that's so interesting. I never really thought about that. Oh, why would you do it this way? You know, artists are sort of making certain demands as to how their art needs to be exhibited. And if you don't push back and you just listen, you learn so much. And so installation is always like just my favorite time. I never liked the openings. You know, I never liked the, the, I mean, when it was a party, it was always fun because there was dancing, but I didn't like the sort of socializing part. I liked having something to do, refill the punch bowl, make sure the beer is there, make sure everyone's okay, you know, check in, facilitate, 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 and then clean up. And I just liked being part of the process. You know, I liked seeing something start from a conversation. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, I've never really thought about that. Like we had this sort of internet web based like computer art show very early on that Brian Dreikor curated and Brian just approached me being like I want to curate this show I had no idea that this type of artwork existed like people who code and make artwork through coding and I was like sure that sounds interesting and you know it was sort of I'm a very curious person and so um I don't think I would, I'm not in that scene. I could have never curated that show on my own. I didn't know about it enough, but Brian was very much sort of involved in that. Because you see one of, one of the you know, characteristics I picked up on uh, 179 was that despite the space's somewhat lo-fi appearance, uh, that this generation of artists were interested in technology, how technology relates to the body mm -hmm. and issues beyond that too but it seemed to me that there were some recurring thematic interests that coincided with generational interests that seemed quite distinct to me at least to other things that were unfolding at the time yeah it wasn't art about the internet it wasn't art about technology it was more you know a questioning into are we changing? Is it changing us? Um, will our bodies change? You know, it's all, it's a lot of speculation. We didn't know technology was developing so quickly. We, there was no way for us to make any predictions. All we knew were that maybe the synapses in our brain were changing um, because of this algorithm, right? The way we're being taught to use social media, I mean, I, I don't use I don't use social media, so I, I don't really know. But you know, this idea of avatars and who's are you a self outside of your body? Is that what the internet's providing you? What then happens to your body? You know, we were this generation having to deal with being born into a time where you just thought you were very connected to the sort of flesh, mind, body, soul and creating an identity through that to then all of a sudden becoming a young adult being offered everything, you know, fluidity, you, everything can change. Because it seemed to me certainly that just as the space was responsive and reactive because you were able to act very quickly to organize a show or to invite an artist to do a project, but also the nature of the work uh, that was unfolding at 179 Canal was also very kind of reactive to social concerns, political concerns, sexual concerns, concerns around identity and so forth. And all of that seemed to coalesce very kind of organically in the, in the program at 179. Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of the artists that we, that I worked with were sort of immigrants in one way or another, um, whether they're an expat or an immigrant, there was a lot of, um, you know, like someone like me, I'm a diaspora person, so I'm thoroughly American. However, you know, I'm just one generation away from my homeland. <laughs> um, you know, what, is, what does that do, right? What, what does assimilation force upon you? 
what does all those years of code switching, right? What does it do to your brain? It, it kind of felt sort of similar to what the internet was offering in some ways. Like your identity is fluid and it can hold dualities. It, you don't have to just say, I'm an artist of this X, Y, and Z, and that's just what it is. And, I mean, even the, the idea of being an artist slash curator slash this slash that, you know, was very interesting. Right, like I, I realized that I didn't want to just be an artist, <laughs> capital A, go to my studio, be in the system in, in this very traditional way. I want to have different parts of my identity within the sort of working aspects of the industry as well. Um, I mean, was there, did you feel any sense of, of tension around that? This sort of idea that your own practice as an artist was being somehow, uh, sidelined perhaps by the, the activity of being coming, you know, a bureaucrat, an administrator, an organizer, a curator, all of the things that are necessary to, you know, make a space just function. Uh, yeah, I think that I still go through that <laughs> to this day. Um, I think that people somehow still feel that these roles have to be so limited, you know, like I can't still work for someone and having founded a gallery and a artist run space and make my own work. Who's to, who's gonna tell me I can't do that? If I can do it, I can do it. You know, I, I'd like to try. I mean, there are certain things that I think I'm not that good at and I just decided not to do it any longer. But yeah, I mean, I still think that uh, people have a hard time understanding that I would still hold on to my day job. I think people find that to be absurd. And I'm like, really? I don't know. Seems pretty uh, practical and straightforward to me. Um, but du during the time frame of 179 Canal, I think it's important to keep underscoring just how short a period in real time this was. It was really essentially a year. Uh, you worked with, I think, something like 75 artists either showed at the space, performed in the space, or were involved in the programming of the space in different ways which is you know, significant, but it seems to me that you also created not just a context for your own thoughts and ideas, but you also collectively or collaboratively or cumulatively created a context for all of your ideas. And a decade later where we find ourselves now, I think a lot of the things that started or unfolded or became more public or present at 179 Canal continue to resonate to this day. I mean, was, was that idea which, you know, you maybe when you referred to this idea of a, a past that wasn't necessarily yours, was the idea of creating a context for yourselves, uh, sort of paramount and perhaps more important than a, a mission statement or a manifesto-like approach to what you were doing. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's never been about the final artwork product, you know, oh, let's just make this perfect white cube so that we can gaze upon a perfect formal artwork. It happens, <laughs> Art, artworks are created and then they're beautiful and we can have that conversation. But it's never been my mission to facilitate that per se. I think my, I mean, I don't want anyone to leave this thinking that I knew what I was doing. Um, <laughs> Ten years, I, I, I had inklings of what I thought I wanted. I think I had, I knew what I was pushing up against. Right, but just because you're against something doesn't mean that you actually know what you're doing. It's a good start. It took some time to sort of figure out what I really wanted to get at, um, as opposed to just being a sort of youthful, rebellious, uh, irreverent person. And, um, you know, towards the end of the run at 179 Canal, I mean, you, you're obviously aware there was broader interest in what was happening there. And I think uh, Cecilia invited you to organize a project at the X Initiative, was that around that, towards the end mm -hmm. of 2019? And obviously I, I was really, you know, I would be on the periphery of what was happening at 179 Canal, but became very interested in it. Um, so even within that time frame, it sort of established a kind of identity for itself, even if that identity was somewhat fluid or porous. Yeah, I think that if I, what, what I wanted to contribute in this sort of 
identity making or whatever I wanted people to take away from it was that collaboration between artists is the best <laughs> and that we should encourage it more often. And that, again, like maybe these collaborative show, like everything I did at White Columns had a sort of collaborative element to it. My show with Darren and Michelle, you know, I was like, here, take some of my artwork, make artworks out of it. Let's do this three person show that looks like a one person show. For the show at the 179 Canal Anyways show at White Columns, dotted in between all the sort of works were these photographs that I made of sort of relics or remnants of shows that had happened at the space. And so those were my works, or maybe they were, no, they were. We can see some of these on the left-hand side yeah. of the screen now, these Actually, small photographs. They were collaborative works and no, what were they? I know I had taken photos of these sort of remnants. Um, and so it was like my sort of cheeky way of inserting my own subjectivity into a show that, you know, was mostly about other people. But I wanted to sort of mark my own history within that. I think in this image we can see on the screen, this is actually a white columns now, and it's the exhibition you organized for us called 179 Canal anyways. But in the previous image is an installation, I think of Josh Klein's show at, 179 Canal, and you can see the, the cloud image continues across into the small photographic image on the left. So moving forward, I mean, 179 Canal closed in the summer of 2010. And around the time the, the project closed, I invited you to think about making an exhibition that took 179 as its kind of departure point. You know, I, I wasn't interested in necessarily making a, a retrospective mm -hmm. exhibition about what happened there or a historical exhibition about what happened there. But I was very interested in the idea of the recent past. And certainly I didn't see everything that happened at 179. I wasn't present for a lot of the things that unfolded there. And I imagine a lot of other people weren't. So I was interested in the idea of whether it was possible to take one idea or one set of ideas that took place somewhere else displace it to white columns and through the, through the form of an exhibition. And um, we have some images that I'll scroll through on the screen of the installation shots of 179 Canal anyways, but what are your memories of being invited to make an exhibition about something that had really only just stopped? I mean, it was really exciting because there was so much activity that was built up by, you know, many, many people at 179 Canal. It wasn't that, you know, we did this year of activity and all of a sudden all these artists were having their doors knocked on. I wanna show you, I wanna get, you know, opportunities up the wazoo. It wasn't, that, that wasn't the case. I think that the things that happened at 179 were a little illegible to most people and, um, so this provided this opportunity for artists who were basically like on fire. <laughs> like they had so much energy, you know, and they just needed more and more places, more venues, more projects to get these ideas out. You know, I, I always felt that most of the artists I worked with at 179 Canal, you know, they just, as soon as you, you open the gate, you just felt like 10 years of work could come streaming out of them. You know, that was sort of what was so interesting and so amazing about being privileged enough to work with most of these artists. It wasn't like, oh, I had one idea now, I don't know. It was like, you know, they'd spent all this time just mapping, mapping out ideas. And so every opportunity to show was just another opportunity to test one of these ideas out and also to not have to do it separately. You know, the thing that always made me kind of sad was that we built all this energy together and then those trajectories, you know, would go off alone. So, oh, this person's at this gallery doing this trajectory and this person's at this gallery, no longer in conversation with one another. And so this was this really nice opportunity for, you know, a group of artists who, I think it was really important for them as well, you know, like this will probably never happen again. It provides some closure to sort of move forward but, um, you know, it's a bigger venue, there's more eyes on it. 
maybe you become more legible, maybe you don't, I don't know, but um, at least we're still doing it together in a way. So like, even though it was displaced from one, you know, moved from one location to another, the spirit, I tried to keep that spirit together. And you know, from the, the exhibition of White Combs, which was called 179 Canal, uh, 179 Canal forward slash anyways, uh, included the work, I think of around 20 artists. So of the 75 that had been involved with uh, 179 Canal in Chinatown, 20 artists work. This is the work of Josh Klein. We can see in front of us on the screen now. Uh, and certainly from my perspective, it, it felt to me that when 179 Canal stopped, there was a lot of forward momentum, which you've also just alluded to in the individual artist works, but it also seemed to me that there was forward momentum socially uh, amongst the, the group of artists. And even at that time, and I don't think I would necessarily have been able to sort of articulate it clearly, it felt to me that something historical, as in art historical, had happened at 179 Canal, even if it was still very fresh in the memory. And that idea of, uh, self-historicization and the avant-garde is, you know, it's a pretty established idea in the, in the history of avant-gardes, but was there any sense of the historical amongst yourself and the group of artists you were working with at the time you were doing? Obviously by the time six months later, you make a show at White Combs. I think, I can't remember exactly, but there was a review of the show where the reviewer suggested that maybe this is too soon uh, to be reflecting on 179 Canal, but in, in a strange way, I thought the exact opposite. It seemed like, a really appropriate time to be thinking about 179 Canal because simultaneous to this, you started to run another space, which was 47 Canal. And we can discuss that later, but was that idea of collective enterprise and as it relates to history, was that something that people were conscious of whilst it was happening? I think all the artists who were involved you know, I think that it felt very special because it didn't seem like this manufactured thing that you paid for, went to debt for, which was like school, which at the time, again, felt like the only way to um, find your tribe in some ways. And, you know, I don't like to self-historicize. I don't think at the time I was probably too tired to even think past, you know, the next day. But I did know just based on my experience in my 20s, it's rare for a group of people, for a group of artists to sort of all want to talk about related, similar, not the same, but, you know, to link up and like that our works could speak to each other. It wasn't just that we socially could hang out joke and you know whatever but that our artworks themselves could could make jokes with each other could like yuck it up that's what I sort of liked about it um and it doesn't happen that often I mean even you know the way the commercial gallery system you know evolved you used to see galleries and you say well this gallery shows art like this this is their interest this is what they are sort of this is the conversation they follow and this gallery does that and, you know, as we saw things consolidate and people got very savvy in terms of how do you make business and how do you make money and what is a diversified portfolio or whatever financial mumbo jumbo made it into our industry was, it's not to have a conversation. It's to have one of this, one of this, one of this, one of this, and one of this. You cover all your bases just in case one show doesn't sell. Don't worry, you've got this blockbuster painting show the next day and it's it's I just didn't like that um and so I didn't feel that there was a space for these artworks it's not about the people themselves but this like the, the artworks themselves to be in conversation that you could like create these shows that the aesthetics and the creation the formalities the materiality you could stick them in a room <laughs> together and move them around. And it, for me, at least, of course, like, I don't know if anyone else felt that, but for me, I felt this sort of kinship through the materiality. Because, you know, I think one of the, you know, the interesting things about what, what I encountered at 179 Canal and then what you can see in the exhibition that you made at White Cons in 2010 is that there isn't necessarily a shared aesthetic sensibility. The, the, the artists are actually quite eclectic in terms of their making and the, the nature of the things that they made. But it seemed to me that there, there was a kind of consistent sensibility 
And I don't know if, again, if this is a generational thing or like you said, it was the, the idea that there was a group of people who found a way to speak to each other through their work and also through their ideas that created a, a larger narrative than perhaps an individual artist practice might have been able to do at that time. So there was a kind of, uh, you know, collectivity um, at play as well. Yeah, I think that it's why we had so much fun that year. Um, as exhausted as all of us were, because, you know, install was always a do-it-yourself. Everyone was all hands on deck. Um, you know, I think that we all knew this wouldn't last, right? Things like this don't last more than a year, oftentimes. It, it's almost impossible to carry through. You know, it has to become something else. It has to change. But one of, one of the ways that you found to carry on at least aspects of this narrative was to start a gallery, 47 Canal, that was much more formally organized as we, you know, to all intents and purposes, it looked like a, an emerging commercial art gallery or it was structured in a similar way, but it allowed you to sustain and maintain and develop conversations with a number of the artists that showed at 179 Canal and were also shown at White Collins. And create something now that, you know, a conversation that continues to this day and has lasted for a decade. I mean, was that transition to running a more conventionally structured space a natural one? Or was it really an attempt to uh, make the next stage for yourself more manageable or more understandable or more legible? When Oliver and I decided to open this gallery together, we had a plan. We had 10 solo shows lined up. We said, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna find a space. We're gonna get a two year lease. These are our first 10 shows. We had it mapped out. We didn't open a gallery just because. We opened the gallery because we felt that these 10 artists should have, again, we felt this energy. We felt that they were ready to have that solo exhibition. That we would commit to these 10 shows. Because in my mind, it would be the perfect ending to this beautiful year that that first show that they did at the commercial gallery could still be with their peers, right? Still be in this conversation. So we did it, we planned it out. We spoke to the 10 artists, we planned out that year and a half and we found the space, of course, just down the street, same side of Canal Street, just further east, second floor. And we didn't think it was gonna last. I mean, nothing I've ever done have I thought, oh, I can't wait till 10 years. It's always been a month, three months, maybe a year. Then it was two years, it was a two year lease. And it was like, if we get through this two years, we'll sort of see what happens. And it just sort of continued from there. And you know, we're coming to the end of our Zoom broadcast this afternoon, but you know, if someone had asked you in 2010 what 179 Canal was, and then they asked you that today, I mean, how different would your ideas about the space be in the, in the space between 2010 and now? I mean, obviously a lot's happened since then and we're older and your understanding of what unfolded subsequently and with hindsight, are they fundamentally this, would they fundamentally be the same or would they be fundamentally very different? I think that, um, yeah, I think that they would be the same to be quite honest. In my mind, like, you know, I don't, I've never wanted to be a commercial art dealer. I've never wanted to be an art dealer. I've always just wanted to have this type of casual space. You know, I've always wanted to be an artist with this type of space where you can invite your friends, I don't know, have a vegan restaurant one month or a record shop or then, you know, something that's always changing because in a city like New York where real estate is cruel and it's so difficult to find your footing, one of the best things to do is to be able to just give someone space. You know, I know how hard it is for people to find that, you know, and it's like, you know, my dream is to be able to take back that space <laughs> and do it again, you know? I mean, of course it would be different artists, it would be different because I'd be older and I'd wanna give opportunities to younger people. But I think 
the spirit and it, it couldn't be the same because I wouldn't be in the friend group. I wouldn't be a peer, but I think I would try to at least find people who are trying to do that. You know, my, my goal was that more people would do it. I don't, I never wanted to be the only one doing it. I was hoping that we were changing culture. We were changing the industry, that this would just proliferate, that all artists would feel that fuck grad school, fuck $150,000 worth of debt. I'm just going to be in conversation with my friends and, you know, do these things on our own for a month, a year, whatever. Every time I see it, it just warms my heart. I'd love to see young people continue to do this. It's, so if I had space and whatever, I would just probably find, you know, a group of people who wanted to do it and just give the keys over in some ways, and not have a heavy hand. But that would be a dream for me. Okay, and that, maybe that's a great place to leave it, Margaret. Um, thanks very much for revisiting 179 Canal and 179 Canal anyways. It <laughs> remains a really favorite project of mine during my time at White Combs. And I, to reiterate, I do think it's hard to believe it was a decade ago, but like you say, it still seems very present. And I think that's partly because yourself and all of the artists that you work with continue to do interesting and amazing things. Oh. Uh, so it, it's a testament not just to you know your enthusiasm to support them at that time, but the kind of collective enterprise that persists to this day. Well, thank you for inviting us. That was great. And thanks for inviting me to this and for always running white columns in the way that you do. Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, for people who are watching now, next week's talk will be on Wednesday at 5 p.m. And it's going to be a conversation between Marilyn Minter and Betty Tompkins, who had solo shows at White Columns in 1988 and 1991, respectively. And I'm going to moderate a conversation between them. So please join us then. And my conversation with Margaret will be archived online at our website for anyone who couldn't stay all the way through or if you missed it completely. So once again, Margaret, thanks very much. And uh, take care and look forward to seeing you in person soon. Bye.